As our work continues, my office sees continuing areas in our findings that Capitol Police needs addressing. Those areas are intelligence, training, operational planning, and cultural change. Our third flash report reflects the continuing need for the department to focus on those four areas of intelligence, training, planning, and cultural change. Based on our ongoing work, this flash report is designed to communicate any deficiencies with the department's counter surveillance and threat assessment operations. Deficiencies included outdated or vague guidance, failure to adequately report stop or contact activities, a lack of dedicated counter surveillance entity, insufficient resources for supporting counter surveillance operations, and inadequate resources for supporting its threat assessment section. The department did not adequately provide detailed and up-to-date guidance in place for its counter surveillance and threat assessment operations, which could have led to unclear guidance and accountability. Additional, additionally, a lack of clear and detailed communications procedures could have increased inefficiencies with processes as well as led to critical counter surveillance information not being appropriately communicated throughout the department. Furthermore, the department did not actually document, collect, analyze with their PD-76 stop or contact reports, which may have impeded its ability to identify trends or patterns that warrant further investigation or dissemination. A standalone entity with a defined mission dedicated to counter surveillance activities in support of protecting the congressional community would improve the department's ability to identify and disrupt individuals or groups intent on engaging in illegal activity directed at the congressional community or its legislative process. The entity should be sufficiently staffed to accomplish its mission and have adequate resources, including dedicated analyst support and a central desk to exploit investigative, disseminate, and triage information in real time. Although the department has increased the number of full-time employees within threat assessment section, the section continues to experience manpower issues. In a previous G report, the IG found the threat assessment section caseloads steadily increased from the beginning of calendar year 2017 through the end of 2019. Department officials and TSA agents stated that increased caseloads as well as staffing levels were some of the greatest challenges for the threat assessment section. The threat assessment section did not have investigative analysts and agents perform tasks such as database checks that investigative analysts performed at other agencies. We found allowing investigative analysts to assume some responsibility from agents would help the agents maintain a manageable caseload for its staff. This is a third in a series of flash reports the IG will produce as part of an ongoing review of the events surrounding the takeover of the United States Capitol. Therefore, we may still perform additional in-depth work related to those areas during our review. Your report says that the uh, intelligence operations section, which is responsible for counter surveillance, had only 13 officers deployed on January 6th to provide actual time intelligence to the department. Does the department have more than 13 counter surveillance officers or is that it? And if there were more, why weren't they deployed on the 6th? How many are there? I think, I believe that number is correct, sir. Um, the, the problem we saw with counter surveillance is it's not a standalone entity. So when we had the pipe bombs, three of the teams went to those pipe bombs and because they're doing double duty, they started conducting an investigation that left one team to cover the Capitol complex. So in other words, if those pipe bombs were intended to be a diversion, plainly speaking, it worked. Yes, sir. So um, how many officers were diverted to the pipe bombs at the DNC and the RNC? Six, it would have been six, so it'd be three teams. The, the teams usually run with two. So, so there, were, there were only seven officers left for the, the rest of the siege of the Capitol, basically. Oh, two, two. So there were four teams initially, so it would have been just two there, and the other six, so eight, it would have been total. Okay. Now, they, like I said, they, they do double duty as yep. well as... Okay. Let me ask you this. Um, how much were uh, our people in threat assessment caught unaware just by the sheer magnitude and ferocity of the violent attack 
on the Capitol. Um, I know that the Department of Homeland Security had identified domestic violent extremism, violent white supremacy as the number one terror threat uh, in the country, but were they just overwhelmed and stunned at the complexity and magnitude of the attack? Thank you, sir. I would I would uh, venture to say yes, and that, that was the problem because what we pointed out, by the lack of having adequate policies and procedures and truly defined roles, all this information that was coming in to the department, it didn't go anywhere. They weren't able to triage it. Uh, that's why we were, we mentioned like a duty desk that would receive and then disseminate that information, vet it out, and get it out to the, either the commanders in the field or even down to the frontline officers. So you're, you're saying the information was flowing in, but because there was only one analyst, there was no way really to synthesize it, interpret it, and then parlay it into an effective response. That would be a correct assessment, yes, sir. Both your flash reports and the honorary, uh, honorary report uh, recommended that Capitol Police a uh, shift from being a police force to a protective force. Can you provide an example of uh, protective forces that you have in mind? It would be something somewhere along the lines of, let's uh, say, the Secret Service, where they have the uniform division. Um, they have uh, the ability to reach out and uh, for training, intelligence, where it's a full-fledged uh, counter-surveillance. All the other elements are within that. And so then building on that, do you think that type of change is possible with the, with the Capitol Police? And, and how should the Capitol Police begin to make this shift? I, I certainly believe the Capitol Police is more than capable of making that shift. Uh, part of that would be uh, having the infrastructure. Now, I spoke with this on a, a previous hearings. Um, even if we hire a thousand officers, we were magically able to produce them. It really doesn't, if we don't have the infrastructure training, if we're not training the officers, not just the initial training, the basic, but the continuous educational training and, de and gear our training towards a protective model as opposed to a police department, then we're not gonna accomplish our goals. We need to be thinking long-term in how to best uh, provide the infrastructure for these officers to be properly trained and continuously trained and not only that, but develop new uh, or having the ability to see uh, new and developing uh, threats and tactics that they would need to be to employ. And, and so then to, to build on the, on the training aspect, it's my understanding that uh, only about 12 out of 28 Capitol Police, instruct, Capitol Police instructors are certified. Is that correct? That is correct, sir, as far as I know. And then do you believe that the, the best training structure would be to centralize this training? Or how else do you believe that this would work? The only way uh, I believe, and I, this is speaking from uh, being at the Office of Training with the Secret Service, as well as my Assistant Inspector General for Investigations, who did a stunt uh, in Raleigh Training Center, if it's not centralized, it's, it's doomed to fail. It has to be centralized at the Office of Training. Training Service Bureau has to be there conducting all training from the highest level it down to the lowest. And, and how do you think that this type of a shift would be received uh, by the men and women uh, that are in service currently at the Capitol Police? From the other previous hearings that I've attended and I've heard, uh, certainly the union has been a voice of needing, wanting more training. So I would imagine that the rank and file would welcome this.